video. No desperation. Oh, come on. What do you mean, roll Two video? Seconds. We're killing ourselves out here, and you're going to be ready. I am too. I'm standing right So we play right mood music? No, I can't Yeah, but when you came out like this, you said it is. We're sitting there because they say, wait yeah. a minute, okay. and then you say yeah. on the radio. But he was always waiting for you to f up in a way. So it was always like, as much as you gave, then it was like you. And you had to get more and more and more and more. And that's why Leon got eaten up. By protruding, I mean anything else sticking up out of your head, the minute you sit in that chair, the, he goes, stop. I go, what? It's going pretty good. It's the minute you sit down in that chair. And I went, <sighs> This pulled all my hair. I pulled hunks of hair out on the windowsill. And the back got cut. Major trim. Hunks of hair. Okay. It just comes out. Okay, right now, fellas. Well, I don't sympathize with Shelly. One of the most puzzling and interesting things in the world is just what goes on inside of Stanley Kubrick's brain, or at least how much of it he devotes to filmmaking. He was notoriously a perfectionist when it came to any of his works, and this may have rubbed off on other people working with him. He was also very notoriously hard to work with. He had sort of a philosophy on set that you either care about the project or you don't. There is no in-between. If you care about the project, then you will put 100% effort into the film, and if you give anything less than 100%, then you don't care at all. Now, his methods may be controversial, but they spawn documentaries and articles and countless YouTube videos describing the process. A few of these that I saw were Room 237, S is for Stanley, and Filmworker. In Filmworker, he's described as the flame that is seductive enough to attract the moth to burn itself. He drew in people to follow him and devote their lives to his craft. A shining example is the documentary's main focus, Leon Vitale, who gave up a successful acting career to work for Kubrick as his assistant because of his immense interest in his work. I turned to the person I was actually watching it with and I said, I want to work for that man. Filmworker also states that he was a chess player and that this is why he is thinking so many steps ahead all the time. Those who worked with him said his attention to perfection was periodically maddening the detail in his film also spawned the conspiracy theories in the documentary Room 237, as it is mostly speculation on what Kubrick truly meant in The Shining. He was so different from anything that was out at the time that people for generations now have been enticed by how he worked and who he w was overall. People were so interested that they made S's for Stanley, which was just about his driver and the stories the driver had to tell about him. He said to me, what do you think about Jack Nicholson? I said, well, looks okay, but why don't you use Charles Bronson? So he laughed. That's also not to mention the museums and exhibits dedicated to his life's work. His storytelling was so inherently different that you might be able to tell it's a Kubrick film just from the character arc. There are other directors like this, like Martin Scorsese, who have their own signature arcs that we see in many of their films, with the rise to power, corruption, and fall of a power-crazy anti-hero. Kubrick's are also similar among his films. Instead of a traditional changing of the character as they go through trials, it is more of a study of their nature than anything else. He chooses his story based on this premise, one that he can get enough content to focus mostly on the character and what makes them truly who they are, and how they remain the same through a changing world at their core. He chooses stories that are imaginative, those that he can take an already wild premise that he can build upon and take his own creative liberties to adapt it to the type of film he thinks will be most effective for the audience. In fact, when Kubrick picks a story to do, he almost never does an original screenplay because he feels that, quote, screenwriters aren't at a high enough level of telling stories as novelists, end quote. He prefers to have the angle of the irreplaceable experience of reading a story for the first time so we can see from a third party view what works and what does not work in the story. In fact, a YouTuber named Cinema Tyler has a great series of videos on how Kubrick picks his source material and how he adapts them into masterpieces. I will link the videos in the bio. He describes why Kubrick chose to do The Shining and how he made it such a classic. In his video, he breaks it down perfectly, how we are shown how the characters act in mundane situations to get a perfect glimpse into their life to show us everything we need to know. He focuses entirely on answering the question of what kind of people they are. He puts us in a situation that we know what is coming, but there's nothing we can do about it. The largest adaptation from the book to film is the huge focus on emotion over logic. Even though we get both, he nearly entirely removes the backstory of the characters because we only need to know what happens, not why. Our imaginations fill in the gaps because we know what kind of person each character is. 
We know Jack is a monster. We don't need to see what turned him into one. Our imaginations can fill that in and is more effective than anything he could have explicitly shown us. Cinema Tyler also describes how he adapted A Clockwork Orange and how he made it a masterpiece. In the video, he says that Kubrick's opinion on historical films was that nobody has ever made a good historical film that puts you in the historical figure's daily life as well as gives it enough information to make it interesting. He said this on why he wanted to make his Lost Napoleon project, but he could not get the funding for that. Because of this, he made A Clockwork Orange with a small budget of just over $2 million. I personally think the reason he chose this story was because he wanted to make a great historical film that wasn't even a real historical film. He figured the fictional Alex DeLarge was interesting enough to make a sort of biography on his life. We see his mundane actions, we see what he enjoys doing for fun, what makes him tick, his relationship with his parents, we see every aspect of his life, and this is what really makes us question why he is the way he is, because there's nothing visibly out of place in his life which makes him a truly interesting character. His parents aren't abusive, he seems to be well off financially, he enjoys things like a regular person, like classic music, he's not an outcast, he has friends, he seems to be just a normal person who enjoys to torment people and do sadistic things for fun. There also seems to be a pattern in Kubrick's films. Another great point from the video is that, in 2001, we see a machine become like a man, but in A Clockwork Orange, we see a man become like a machine. We see constant altering of humans for corrupt reasons, but at the same time, we see at their core, they're the same as they always have been. Again, we see under a microscope the nature of the character above all else. In Full Metal Jacket, we see a group of men be brainwashed to become killing machines. Another parallel between machine and man. But a human can never be a machine. You cannot rewrite who a person is. Alex Delarge has the same desires at the end of A Clockwork Orange as at the beginning. Private Joker still wants peace by the end of Full Metal Jacket, despite killing a young girl. While most filmmakers seem to pick an interesting story, then write the narrative structure and the best way to tell the story, Kubrick seems to pick only stories that fit his flat character and story arc. In every story, he shows the shortcomings of men, whether in a comedic way like Dr. Strangelove, or a dramatic way like Eyes Wide Shut. All of his characters are very different, but when you strip away the exterior, they're all the same. They feel the same emotions. They all have shortcomings. They all respond to problems in multiple ways. The only differentiators are the means of how these characteristics are reached. All of his filmography seems to be character studies with a story to complement it. This is why Kubrick says, A good story is a miracle, because not many stories focus enough on the interesting details of the character enough, as the people in most stories are often means to move the story along. But without an interesting character, the story is nothing, and Kubrick knew this. He even goes as far as changing the source material, as he notoriously changed The Shining significantly from the novel. He adds the final scene of A Clockwork Orange and takes out the final chapter of the book to give these flat character arcs. I wouldn't even call these flat character arcs, I would argue the arc is more round than flat, because it seems that the cycle will continue over and over, and the story will never end as the ending scene of The Shining suggests the cycle of violence will continue forever. 2001 A Space Odyssey also ends on a giant fetus floating through space, suggesting that humanity is being reborn, and they will likely follow the same path as humans before. Another cycle. Barry Lyndon starts and ends with Lyndon dueling, and doing things only for his advantage, as well as things happening by coincidence and some may argue fate. He will continue this cycle until his demise. Although I think the documentary Room 237 can be quite ridiculous at times, it does show me something very interesting. I'm referring to the section where they talk about if you play The Shining forward as well as backward at the same time, major beats of the story will line up, such as when Danny asks his dad if he will hurt him, that matches up with Grady convincing Jack to hurt him and his family. Jack's turning point in the bathroom matches up with the twins' appearance to Danny, the bear-suited man matches up with the blood scene from the elevator, and Jack Nicholson's name in the credits matches up with the final portrait. This shows me how, even though these things may not be intentional to match up, his plots are very symmetrical. It seems that this reveals how a character behaves in the story, and it is reflected over a point of symmetry, giving it a very rounded feel. This helped me form a conclusion that Jack was always a part of the hotel in some way, and always will be. That's my interpretation of the final shot of the film. And while he progressively does get worse throughout the film, he seemed to always be drawn to the hotel and always seemed like he intended harm upon his family. I also want to talk about Kubrick's shot selection a little bit. 
the reflective feel is amplified as shown in a blog I will link in the bio describing what they call Kubrick's Kaleidoscope. It shows how reflective his shots are, as well as how these shots are reflected themselves in modern cinema, which took influence from these shots. His shots are famously symmetrical, which gives a feel that it is an alternate reality or that something is at least off. He created elaborate sets to achieve this cinematography. It also has one point perspective that averts our attention to one subject, but gives us a more interesting shot, showing us the environment as well, making the environment seem like a character itself. He also uses music's relationship with images, as this is a purely cinematic tool to give us the circular, reflective feel in A Clockwork Orange, like how classical music in the beginning seemed to empower and bring joy to Alex, but then it nearly made him end his life because of the traumatic testing done to him. But then at the end, classical music is played at the scene where he's back to where he started, bringing the story full circle. To describe Kubik's writing, I would say it's non-literal. It never really has one meaning. It's very visually heavy. There are six to eight units, as he said himself. I'll also link a blog in the description where he describes his thoughts on narrative. They're slow starting, mostly about the viewer's experience, unconventional storylines, controversial, challenging, timeless stories, leaves room for imagination, hence the Room 237 documentary, Adap adaptive yet takes creative liberties, lenient on changing scripts if it works, the best plot is no plot ideal, and some parts are never explained. I will get into the directing aspects, like his shots and set design, likely in another video, because I want to dedicate more time and research to give that the attention it deserves. It is arguably more important than the writing, because it is his way of writing before our own eyes. He's painting with reality. Kubrick's statement he makes with these round character arcs is that nobody truly changes. Human nature will always be the same no matter what happens to it. We as humans will be greedy, do horrible things to get what we want. We will become evil, selfish, and cause nothing but pain. But at the same time, we will fight for peace, we will love, we'll make art, search for meaning. We desire what we desire and we always will, no matter what happens to us. I guess the main type of story that Kubrick selects to tell is a story that will never end, hence the timelessness of each of his projects. Harmony, M -I -C -K -E -Y -M -O -U -S -E, Mickey Mouse.